Good evening, everybody, and welcome um, to Hillingdon Library's Culture by Author events. This evening, we're delighted to bring you an event with hugely acclaimed best-selling author, Claire McIntosh, um, who we've had in person talking about her previous novels. And tonight she's talking about Hostage, her latest thriller. Um, to interview her this evening, uh, we have the wonderful Jake Kerridge, who is a journalist and crime reviewer for The Telegraph. Um, so without further ado, I will pass over to the two of you. And I can't wait to hear what you you um, tell us about Hostage. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm going to be uh, talking to Claire, um, asking her a few questions. And if any of you guys out there have questions, um, do uh, type them up and send them to us. And we'll get to those in about 45 minutes, I think. But uh, Claire and I are going to have a quick chat first. Um, she's one of Britain's most successful, best-selling crime writers, a former police officer who published her first novel, I Let You Go. It was only in 2014, but she already feels like one of the established stars of British crime fiction. Uh, her fifth novel is Hostage, as you just heard. It's just been published a couple of weeks ago, and it's absolutely one of the most gripping uh, books of the year. I think, wh whatever you do, if you're a football fan, don't start reading it about, um, I don't know, six or seven o'clock on Sunday <laughs> evening, because you'll, you'll look up and you'll realise you've missed the whole game. It's um, absolutely really gripping but also I think it's probably a good thing it's been published in a year when um, not many of us are going to be traveling by plane to many places and you'll find out why in a moment. Um, the book it's received high praise from some of the greats of crime fiction. Lee Child says it's hypnotically good that's a great word isn't it hypnotically good. Um, Linwood Barclay says it's a true page turner that will have producers lining up with movie offers and Karen Slaughter says, hostage will have you questioning, what would you do at every turn? So uh, Claire McIntosh is the author of Hostage. Welcome, Claire. Thank you very much. What a nice introduction. And um, it, it, it does feel like this was a normal year. I, I wonder if WH Smith would feel a bit nervous about stocking this in their airport shops because it's, it's mad isn't it although I heard an interesting fact um, which may or may not be accurate that books with aeroplanes on them, whether they're, you know, sort of scary covers or nice floaty contrails and clouds, sell brilliantly at airports. And I don't know if it's a sort of a deliberate thing that we're actually readers are seeking out flight based stories or whether we're just instinctively drawn to them because we're in that holiday mode. I'm not sure. Uh, and in some uh, some books with aeroplanes on, you know, they're nice and romantic and some of them things go horribly wrong and yours is firmly in the second category. Um, I think that um, as well as being very gripping, it, it deals with a lot of contemporary concerns about the environment and many things. We, we'll get to that uh, a bit later, but I, I think um, maybe I'll ask you to set up the characters for us first. One of the main characters is Mina, um, uh, who's a flight attendant. I wonder if you can tell us a bit about her and this very special flight she's on. Yeah, sure. So the so she's been a flight attendant for a number of years. She's quite experienced. She's a, a mum. She's a mum to five-year-old Sophia, who is adopted and has a, a few sort of behavioural um, issues that can be quite challenging. And so Mina has this peculiar mix of feelings whenever she goes to work, which I think is common to any parent, where part of you feels guilty at leaving your child and the other half is absolutely ecstatic that you get to leave your child. Um, and so that's kind of where she is every time she goes to work. And she is on this very special flight, which is the inaugural 20 hour nonstop flight from London to Sydney. Now this actually doesn't exist yet. It should exist and it would have run this year or last year if it hadn't have been for the pandemic. But it's a route that is proposed at the moment. The longest flight is 19 hours and it's London to Perth. But this is just a little bit a little bit further and they're still doing uh, test flights at the moment. But uh, yeah, she's she's on this flight and not long into the flight, she receives an anonymous threat from one of the passengers on the plane who wants her 
to uh, assist in the derailment of this uh, of this flight. Can you derail a flight? Maybe not. I'm, I'm, I'm not <laughs> <laughs> the de-airing of this flight. Um, and Mina has to make uh, an impossible decision. She has to choose between doing her job and keeping the plane and the passengers safe uh, and risking the lives of her family or keeping her family safe, but mm -hmm. letting the plane crash. Yes, so it's a bit of a slow build up. There are various little clues that suggest that things are not quite right, that items appear on the plane that um, shouldn't be there. Yeah, um, she has this kind of unsettling feeling. Um, and she's kind of nervous about this flight anyway, because it is a really long way. And um, there's, I mean, I, I, I love flying, really, really love flying. But I also find it a bit of a weird Thing, and, and specifically long haul flights, that the idea that we are all in this tin box with a load of strangers and that you're sleeping next to a stranger, you know, you're sleeping, mm -hmm. if you're in, in standard economy class, you're sleeping closer than sometimes I sleep to my husband. <laughs> you know, you're like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the most bizarre thing. And, and we do that and we eat. We eat a meal in silence with a stranger next to us. Um, and we go to the bathroom and we come back and we climb over their legs and all these sort of very intimate things with people who all have different stories, different agendas. And I just I find that fascinating. And it felt like really rich territory for a, a thriller. Yeah, definitely. And um, Mina is, is narrates some of the story, but we also... Um, get inside the minds of some of the other passengers. Um, mm. It's a bit of a, um, it's a, a, the, the clues in the title, it's a hostage drama, but also um, it's a bit of a whodunit because we don't know who is going to, which passenger is going to be the threat. Um, and we sort of get to know them first and we can make our own decisions. But uh, we do, it's uh, a kind of a, um, it, it's a bit of a mashup of, of genres, I guess, in, in that respect. that. It could be, um, I could have written it as a, as a straightforward thriller, you know, an action thriller, yeah. lots of high octane um, stuff going on in the sky. But that's not really what I do. You know, I like the exciting stuff and I like the twists. But what I really like is getting inside people's heads. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I was a police officer for many years. And I think that process of interviewing people and understanding a bit more about what makes people cross that line between good and bad um, means that that's an area that I really want to write about and so we we have we have Mina and we also have her husband Adam and we hear a lot of what's going on in his life and his life is not straightforward either um, and then we have these little vignettes from passengers um, which is very much fueled I think from traveling alone so most of my all of my work travel is is solo which means i don't have children vomiting on me or asking for snacks or you know people trying to talk to me it's just me and the people around me and so like any writer i'm making up stories and wondering where they're going and who they're going to see and how they feel about it and what they're doing and those vignettes in hostage enable the reader to think a little bit about why people are on that flight, what took them to that point in their life, and perhaps a little bit about why they've made the choices they've made. So there's this huge gallery of characters, and obviously it's that great thing, um, setting a book on a plane, you can do that thing about the difference between the people who get to turn left at the beginning and the ones who go right, and, and they're in different classes, and there's a bit of class-based <laughs> tension um, among the passengers. Yeah. There, yeah, there is a little bit. And I, I think, um, so So I, I, I flew business class. I've never flown first class. I flew business class for the first time when, gosh, when was it? 2016, when I went on tour to America and I wasn't flown business class. And on the way back, I, I was really tired and I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to treat myself. You know, this might be the only time I, I ever go to America with work. I'm, I'm going to celebrate. So I upgraded myself on the way back um, because it was quite a good deal. 
And they always say that if you fly business class, you spoil yourself for any future travel. And it's so completely true. And so I had this amazing trip on the way back and I was that very overexcited person pressing all the buttons and, you know, seat going back and forwards and legs up and blankets and, you know, aromatherapy spray and anything that that they would give me. Um, But it has spoiled it a little bit. And so now I, you know, I travel in lots of different ways and not not always in in nice places but I am quite interested in the way that it can change you if you get used to nice things Mm -hmm. um not everybody but you know there's a certain personality type that becomes quite entitled and so that was quite interesting as well to to think about um so on this fictional plane and I, I was I deliberately chose to design a plane and that was partly for creative purposes, but mostly so that nobody could complain when I get it wrong. <laughs> um, and so I've created this plane and it has a bar in the middle. And I love flying on planes with bars. I <laughs> think It's the most ridiculously decadent thing ever. And um, so this plane has a bar on it and behind the bar is economy and they're not allowed to use the bar. But then in front of the bar are business class and they are. But it's quite easy to sneak into the bar, and so there's a bit of a, a, a bit of a clash um, in in the book between uh, economy and business class. And I really, I, as I was writing it, I was kind of pulled in both directions. You know, I've been on both sides of the curtain, and I I, I could see both arguments. Yeah, um, there may be a reason why it's it's an advantage to be in the economy rather than the business class later in the book, but we won't give won't give it away. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so you've got um, because it's this big inaugural flight, there are loads of celebrities on board. Um, so you've got you know characters going to see um, family members and things, but also there are the celebs um, hoping for free booze. Um, and you've got this uh, this horrible Jeremy Beadle style YouTube prankster yes. and um, this David Beckham style footballer. And I think you said in the acknowledgments there was your agent picked up on a problem. Oh yeah, so I. So the foot, there was just a tiny kind of um, issue with with the footballer. So this flight is just before Christmas, and I and I wanted a footballer. And I, you know, there's a little bit of of cliche in it, I, I suppose. But um, you know, the footballer and and his wife and lots of selfies. Um, and my agent, who is brilliant in many ways, but is also a keen sports fan, said, "Well, this this is no good. He's you know he, he couldn't possibly travel." Uh, to Australia just before Christmas and I I, this would never have occurred to me Mm. Um, so I thought okay well I will make him uh, injured but apparently that's no good either because they're quite strict in sport and if you're injured you've got to stay and be at all the briefings and you know be part of the the team mentality so um, poor Jamie I had to retire him that was the only (laughs) way I could you know it was either that or write him out of the the book completely uh, which would be far too much hard work so I retired him very young, but there it is. You know, he's a very successful footballer, so uh, he could go to Australia for Christmas. Yeah. The moral of the story is you need a sharp-eyed agent. Um, you really do. I tell, I tell you something else as well that that isn't in my my author's note. I made a mistake with uh, with dates, and this is part of you know as you get older, time has a really peculiar way of behaving, and so. Someone says to you, oh, you know, the 90s, and you're like, well, that wasn't very long ago, you know, that sort of thing. So this book was printed, and the proof copies went out, so the advanced copies, um, and it had been edited, I don't know how many times here in the UK, and lots of mistakes spotted. Anyway, it went to America, had its copy edit there, and just as we were about to go to print in the UK, the American copy editor said, um, just a small problem here. You've got Mina, the flight attendant, sort of mentioning how she was at work soon after 9-11. Um, that would have made her about 12. Um, and I think in my head, because I can remember, like all of us, I can remember yeah. that the horror of watching that on the news. And it seems just like no time ago at all. And so I had Mina remembering it as well and and working just as I was working, forgetting that I'm 44 and Mina is 34 or how old she is. Um, And so I couldn't have that. So that was a very good save by um, uh, basically editors are amazing. 
yeah, they earn their money often. Yes, this, this sort of thing happens all the time, doesn't it, with, with everyone? It does, and it's always. I mean, quite often readers say, uh, you know, they spot a typo or, or something that's not quite right, and mostly they're very lovely about it. And it's always great to hear those things. So I always encourage people to message me and, and tell me when they spot errors because they can be fixed in in reprints and, and in the digital version. Sometimes readers get quite sort of sniffy about it and say, you know, I found a typo. Honestly, they should ask me to proofread. Uh, you know, I can't believe a, a professional book has let this mistake get through. And you think, well, there's 120,000 odd words hmm. in this book and things change all the time and you're, you know, you're, you're making edits right up to the last minute. And I think it's kind of inevitable that a letter or two occasionally slips through the net um, it's never really bothered me as a reader, but uh, there, there are some pedants out there, I think. <laughs> well, that, that, that's their fun, though, isn't it? So <laughs> they get, yeah, get something out of spotting a mistake. Yes, that's, that's, that's true. I got a Scrabble score wrong in uh, Let Me Lie. There's a, you know, a fictional game of Scrabble happening between two characters, and um, a, a reader wrote in to say, I thought it was rather brilliant, actually, to say that, yes, that was the score, except that, actually, if you put those tiles down, you would inevitably be on either a double or a triple letter score. And so that would change the score accordingly. It's dedication. Yeah, it shows people are reading your books very carefully, though. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, another interesting thing about this scenario is um, uh, the passengers, um, because they, they realise they're in danger, secrets come spilling out about their lives. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a good way to get really down into people's lives. Um, yeah, it's it's probably um, well. I think I think a crisis point is always a good point to to meet somebody, you know, to meet yeah. a character, because they're often kind of at their most raw. And there's um, there's something about being being in peril and sort of potentially facing death that does encourage you to to spill. Um, and yeah, so we, we get to meet uh, quite a few people who have regrets. Um, uh, a washed up journalist, I do love a washed up journalist, um, <laughs> who uh, who I, I really like him and I feel sorry for him because he's, he's an older chap who's really good at his job, but yeah. has kind of been, you know, superseded a little bit by bright young things with smartphones and he perhaps hasn't quite kept up with the times as you have, Jake. And so yeah. um, <laughs> <Give it five. laughs> he's facing redundancy, but he things work out in the end. Yeah, he, I thought, yeah, he was a great character. And there is also a journalist from The Telegraph who manages to file a story from, <laughs> from the plane. <laughs> that, yeah, she's really dedicated, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned that quote from Karen Slaughter, hostage will have you questioning, what would you do at every turn? And I suppose, um, you know, without giving the full extent of the dilemma away, uh, Mina has to face um, a dilemma. And that, that's one of the things of reading the book. You think, um, what judgment would I make in that situation? Because it's a no-win judgment. You know, you have to make one of two very horrible decisions. Yeah, it is. It's it's sort of um, almost literally between the devil and the deep blue sea, isn't it? Um, and these, I, I suppose this this is what that pins down what I write um, in all my books is, is these, these difficult decisions and these ordinary people against whom the odds are stacked. So I could have, because I thought a lot about whose point of view I wanted to write this story from, um, because it was, it was partly inspired by a conversation with a pilot friend of mine, a female pilot who was telling me about how they, they cannot open the, the flight deck door if there's a, a problem in the cabin. And if she was traveling with her family, which sometimes ha happens, you know, the family are in the cabin, she's flying the plane. If she looked at the security cameras and saw her own child held at knife point on the other side of that door, she's forbidden from opening that door. And I said, wow, you know, I, I can understand why, but what would you do in that situation? And she she just wouldn't answer the question. She, she kept saying, I'm not allowed to open the door. Mm. And so for a time, I thought, well, I'll, that's my book. I'll, I'll, write, I'll write that. I'll write that from her perspective. But the problem with that 
is a it's quite constrained you know you're you're in a flight deck there's there's no one else there there's a co-pilot but there's no one coming in in or out um whereas actually the flight attendants are having to deal with physical people and and physical sort of uh risk and confrontation but also being a pilot is slightly less accessible for people for readers so and there are lots of books that write you know brilliantly from the point of view of pilots and astronauts and sort of james bond figures and that's great but what i like to write are books with characters that people can imagine them in those roles and i think it is easier for somebody to relate to a flight attendant or a mum or a dad or you know the bloke who works in in the shop down the road and to then sort of root for them mm. than it is someone who who already has a sort of sense of of power and and uh position i suppose mm. and uh, there's a great bit in um but because because of the circumstances you know, mina is not um feeling the need to be quite as polite as she normally would so when a passenger is rude to her she get, she gets to be rude back for once well it's hard isn't it this is one of the things i think is difficult in their role uh, i've got a huge amount of respect for for flight attendants because they are treated like waitresses yeah, yeah. And waiters all, all the time um and yet that is not their job you know they the, the hospitality side is kind of a bolt on their job is to keep you safe and to keep the you know the, the flight safe um and it's a little bit like being a police officer in that there's nowhere to go you've 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 got to be smiley all the time you've got to be kind of on with the public um and i i love when i'm on a flight i love looking behind the curtain you know if you go to the bathroom and perhaps the lights are dimmed and it's you know they've finished serving meals and everyone's kind of settled down and the flight attendants are just sort of hanging out in the galley and they've maybe taken their heels off and they're chatting about what they're going to do when they get there and they're, they're sort of a half off duty and half on and I love that it's it's literally like glimpsing behind the curtain in a in a theatre and so writing hostage was a little bit about it was about trying to get behind that role and showing something that perhaps we don't really think about it's crazy though that they're actually trained to think about what would happen if someone was threatening your child with a knife on the plane it's mad isn't it and i tried to um uh to get so i did quite a lot of research for this book because i've i've written uh police-based books before and i you know can write authentically obviously without doing any research at all which makes made my job very very lazy and very easy but what it meant was that i kind of gained a reputation for writing authentically mm -hmm. and so moving into um an environment that i didn't know anything about I, I had to work a lot harder because i want i want to keep that reputation for writing authentically but i don't have the background knowledge myself so i did loads of research and one of the things i tried to do so i went to fly a, a simulator was was the first thing which was huge huge fun and i went with my son who did a brilliant job because he plays playstation and then i had to go and crashed horribly at sydney airport but then i tried to book onto a um onto hostage training which runs um just for flight staff and then they do occasionally allow members of the public to pay for the experience of being in a simulated hostage situation really? um anyway annoyingly it, it wasn't running you know and covid happened and lots yeah. lots got in the way but i read lots of accounts of people that had done this training you know reviews and and it actually sounds completely terrifying mm -hmm. that you really sort of forget and i i've been in in similar similar simulated environments as a police officer where you know it's dark and there's smoke bombs going off and noise and it's very hard to remember that it's not real you know there's your your instinct takes over and it, it's really quite scary yeah i wonder what sort of person wants to do it for fun unless unless they're all um <laughs> novelists doing research but well novelists or uh you know or up to no good and they they do yeah. have quite a robust checking process <laughs> to make sure that you're not just going there you know because you plan to hijack a plane 
and um, it is uh, you, you you said um, uh, about the book maybe not being so high octane, but it does get very high octane um, as it goes along. I think it it really does. Uh, but at the same time, your, your family dynamics are really your thing. They're always at the heart of mm -hmm. all your books, I think. And it really is with this one. You know, uh, Mina has a very complicated relationship with her husband. Um, and uh, they have a um, complicated relationship with their adopted daughter. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about the, the, the family setup in this a bit and, and how, yeah. how, how you sort of marry doing the uh, family issues with the thriller aspects of the books. Well, so, so it does always come first for me, like like you said, it's at the heart of everything that I do. And I think that any good thriller doesn't have to focus on family dynamics, but I think it should it should put character at its heart because there that's what keeps you turning the pages, you know, that you want to find out what happens to, to, to people. Um, and also, however good you are at twists uh, and reveals, there are always going to be readers who are better than you, who will oh, guess yeah. the twists, and 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 you still have have a responsibility to give them something. And so you you can't make a thriller just about thrills and excitement. You you have to to make it meatier and denser and, and richer, just like real life. So I started with the characters, and Sophia, who is five, is really integral to this story both in terms of character dynamics and why her parents make certain decisions but also actually in terms of, of plot um, and she came from a, a conversation with a friend of mine whose daughter is eight and was adopted as a baby just as Sophia was and my friend was telling me about uh, a time not so long ago when her eight-year-old daughter came to her came to her mother for a hug for the first time so that's the first time in eight years that her daughter has instigated affection wow. uh, which was a hugely emotional story to tell and really made me think about the legacy of those early weeks you know they have a great relationship this this mother and daughter but that child cried a lot as a baby in her birth family and had no response no one came and those are our learned lessons that take a very, very long time to, to get over. Um, and so I spoke to my friend at length about attachment disorder and the, uh, the, the sort of the issues that, that they face. I have a daughter who has autism and, and for whom affection can be quite a, a tricky subject. You know, sometimes she needs to be held, but doesn't want to be held and and so I knew a little bit about that area and that helped me to form Sophia who is very very bright and very bright children can also be challenging to parent you know she's incredibly uh, precocious was reading at three and you know can uh, absorb information very very quickly and what that does is it puts a pressure not just on each parent in terms of their relationship with Sophia, but also in each other on on each other. And um, I, I was sort of interested in the you know I've been a parent for fourteen and a half years, and sometimes I find myself kind of you know arguing a little bit with with my husband. And actually, it's not to do with what we're saying to each other. It's actually coming from somewhere else in the in the family. And that's very much what happens with with Adam and, and Mina is that that those dynamics between them as a couple and them as a as a family of three can cause some some you know fractures. And Adam has his own issues involving the au pair, but uh, we, we won't say any more about that. <laughs> we won't talk about the au pair. No, he does have he does have issues. We we meet Adam's a police officer and. I, I suppose partly I can't move entirely away from from the police. It, it feels like such a natural world for me to inhabit, uh, and it's also a link to my other books. Uh, and I'll be going back to the policing world, so it kind of is a thread that runs through my my writing. But also, I wanted to write about uh, uh, the person behind the police. I, I think we're 
you know, we as readers of crime fiction are, are always very interested in the person behind the police. That's why we end up with these tropes of police officers who are divorced and have, you know, drinking problems and um, which, you know, are partly tropes, but also very true. I do know a lot of police officers who are divorced and have drinking problems. Um, so we are interested in mm. what makes them tick. And what we've got in Adam in Hostage is actually a 100% man rather than police officer. Yeah. And we see him with all his weaknesses and, uh, you know, anxieties, just like the rest of us. Mm. Yes, we, we, we're we not seeing him in a professional capacity. No. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a terrible point where Mina starts worrying because things have gone so badly wrong. It's it's karma for the for every time she's felt irritated with Sophia or been short with her. Um, and this is, you know, I think parents do feel um, like this when something bad happens, not necessarily as bad as this, but it's quite a yeah. feeling people can relate to. Oh, it is. A absolutely. And I, uh, you know, I used to feel incredibly guilty whenever I went to work, when I was still in the police. Um, and and also um, kind of uh, sort of torn that, that I, uh, you know, I was mum at, at home and mum at work, but actually there was always a bit of both of me where, wherever I was. And, uh, and I think it's a, a really difficult, um, it, it's difficult as a parent to, to go to work and, and leave your sort of your home identity behind and then again when you come home from work and, and Mina is very much torn between those two worlds I think. Um, there's a, a lot of discussion in this book about uh, environmental issues and sort of the environmental impact of flying it, it's, it's something I think you clearly want your readers to think about even if you're not you know uh, pursuing a particular political point um, and obviously it's something that you're fascinated by you've been thinking about yeah it's so i i read i don't tend to read very many reviews of my books um because for various reasons it doesn't, uh, it doesn't <laughs> put me in a great place um even when they're good it doesn't put me in a great place but i happened to read a, a review the other day that uh that was very cross about the fact that i talk about climate change in this book and was specifically cross about the fact that i mention it in my author's note to, to um, you know, things that I'm, I'm about to say are, are almost certainly what's in my author's note. And this reviewer commented and said, uh, I don't read books to, uh, to hear politics, to hear political views. And I would argue that all books are political because life is political and every decision we make is, is political. And so although it's not you know, Hostage is certainly not a, a political book. Mm -hmm. There are always going to be political issues in it, and climate change is, is one of them. And it's something that I... Uh, so I know I know that people... There are people who argue that our climate isn't changing. I'm not one of them. I, you know, I, I look at the, the, the scientific evidence, and it seems quite obvious to me that we have... A climate change uh, emergency and so I think we all have to think about how we respond to that um, and flying is a really big issue and and the reason I've been thinking about it is because I pre-pandemic fly a lot mm. uh, and that's a responsibility that you know I need to take on and think about whether or not those are essential journeys. And, and I found it very, very interesting over the last 18 months. You know, this, this book was already written and I was, was editing uh, during 2020 that suddenly we, we have all these conversations about essential journeys and suddenly we've discovered ways of working around the world without traveling and of doing events without traveling. And I'm hopeful that actually that will lead to a reduction in in flying and I know that that's devastating for people working in that industry and that you know that's the the difficult thing about it but I am going to try and travel a little bit less I think. Mm. Well, I know you, you talk about that in your afterword but I'm surprised by that review because uh, it's not as simple as environmentalists good um, flyers bad in this book at all it's much more 
complicated than that. No, no, it's it's not. And I I think what the reviewer was objecting to actually was not the book, but my need to comment on the book. You know, my my need to include that message, um, which is really just my my thinking behind it. You know, it's it's yep. me sort of thinking out loud and reflecting on the uh, on my experience of of protesters because this is a book um, that. You know, I, I could I could have written a, a a hostage book, a hijack book about any form of terrorism, and I think there is a, an assumption when we hear the word terrorism to immediately picture a religious fanatic, and of course there are so many different types of terrorism and extremism, and and as I mentioned in in my my author note, my first encounter with extremism was with animal rights protesters and i found it really quite quite shocking and quite um extraordinary that this group of people who were clearly nice people in that they cared about animals you know they you assume an animal lover is a nice person and they cared so strongly about animals that they would set fire to a research scientist's family home and that kind of dichotomy was was really difficult for me as a young police officer to get my head round. You know that they're doing they're doing bad things for good purposes, and that's ultimately that's protest, isn't it? That that's how uh, violent protests play out. They they are people who are trying to make good changes, but they're doing it in such a way that is causing harm or, or violence. Uh, and and I specialised in in protests uh, towards the end of my, my career, I became a, a public order commander and um, worked in, in um, sort of large operations. And I found it really interesting to talk to protesters and understand a bit more about why they feel that sometimes the end justifies the means. And it, it's, not, it's not a simple argument. You can't say that, you know, someone's right or wrong or that in this case, you know, you, you should be allowed to break the law and there you shouldn't. It, it, it's much more complex than that. And that makes it very rich territory for a writer. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, I quite often ask crime writers this when they write about scary things. And in this case, you know, you have to really imagine yourself right into a very scary situation. I wonder, do you ever give yourself nightmares? Do you, do you dream about, <laughs> about no. being on a, on a plane? And, uh... No, well, no, I have. I, I certainly didn't get any nightmares with with hostage. Um, I worked myself up into a bit of a state on a so the very the last flight I ever took um, was in February 2020, mm. and I was a little bit sort of anxious anyway because I'd gone I'd gone out to Dubai, and I no I was going. So going out, to, yeah, I was going out to Dubai to work in the prison there, which makes me, and I've done it a, a few times now, and it makes me slightly sort of anxious anyway because I'm, um, I always have this irrational fear that I'm going to break a law that I know nothing about and end up in prison, which is, you know, ridiculous because I am generally very law abiding. So I was sitting on the plane, and we hadn't taken off, and and we were delayed and delayed and delayed, and no one was telling us anything, and so there was that slightly uneasy feeling. And I was writing a very, very tense scene towards the end of this book with terrorists in it uh, and with, you know, a threat of weapons and, and things that I won't spoil. And it was getting quite fast and I was typing furiously. And then suddenly there was a big announcement and we were all told to leave the plane and no one told us why. Anyway, in my head, because I'd worked myself up into such a state, I was convinced that uh, Emirates, the airline, which of course is owned by the Emirati government, had somehow sort of hacked into my computer and had read this this scene and that I had caused this entire plane to be right. grounded. Anyway, obviously it was nothing to do with me at all. So that sort of thing happened. Right. Right. Work myself up into a bit of a state. Yeah. So you but, weren't worried about the plane being hijacked. You were worried that, that you had caused it. Oh, yeah, that's how egocentric I am, Jake. I was worried that I had caused this entire situation. Oh, that's great. Um, 
I just want to ask, I saw you um, on Twitter uh, talking to Vasim Khan um, earlier or yesterday, and you were reminiscing about your early days doing events with uh, not many people turned up. <laughs> and it, it, uh, it just it made me want to ask you just a little bit about your sort of road to publication. I don't know how long it took you if you if you um, had rejections of your novels, your first novel. It uh, is a very irritating story. Right. Anyone who is submitting oh, to think, yeah. so, so this, this is a one of those stories that will make people cross if they're in the process of submitting but i'm going to tell it because it has a moral to it okay so i have never submitted to an agent through conventional channels i um set up a literary festival in chipping norton because i'd left the police and i was worried that i would be really bored at home with with my children that's awful isn't it but i i needed something to kind of make my my brain hurt so i set up this literary festival and i was put in touch with somebody who i was told knew a bit about authors that was literally you know i know someone who knows a bit about authors and that somebody turned out to be um the former commercial director of foils a woman called Vivian Wordley, who is a, a friend now and, and a really amazing woman. Um, and we talked about the festival and then she said, are you writing, do you write? And I said, well, I'm, I'm writing this book. And I told her about I Let You Go, which was my debut. And I basically, I told her the twist and I Let You Go, you know, I won't spoil it, but it has a fairly sizable yeah. twist in it, which has, you know, worked quite well. And she said, do you know what? I think that might have, quite strong commercial appeal. Could I send it to a friend of mine who's an agent? So obviously I said, yes. Anyway, she said, um, she said, I'm not gonna tell you which agent it is because then, you know, if the agent doesn't like it, it can all be anonymous and it won't be awkward. So she took it off and I didn't know anything else about it except that I was, you know, former police officer and I don't like a mystery. So I, I, I stalked every agent until I'd worked out the connection and I knew then that it had gone to Sheila Crowley at Curtis Brown. Right. And so I stalked her for ages, hoping that she would tweet something like, I'm reading this incredible manuscript, um, which she didn't. But she did ring me and she said, uh, I she said that, that this is in a pretty terrible state, this book. Um, but this twist, this twist is phenomenal. She said, I don't know if you can do what you're, I don't know if you can pull it off. But if you can pull it off, then this could be really exciting. And so that was kind of it. And she took me on. Um, and, the, and that is annoying for people who are, who are submitting to agents. But the only reason I was introduced to that agent is because I'd said, yes, I'm, I'm writing. I, you know, I'm, I've written a book. And I think that we, we writers are often very embarrassed to say that we're writers and to say that we're writing our first novel. And it's a very odd thing because people aren't embarrassed about other hobbies. You know, if, if you if you like to, um, I don't know, crochet, you don't keep that a secret. And equally, no one kind of expects you to be a professional crocheter. You, you just crochet because you like it. But writing, perhaps because it, it takes so much of our, our kind of our, our soul, our heart, mm. it feels so personal that we don't tell people. But if you're watching this and you are uh, an aspiring um, author, then you know tell people, be proud of it. Because if you don't tell people, you'll never have that serendipitous moment where you realise that your postman's wife's cousin's neighbour mm. is actually Johnny Geller, or you know is is head of commissioning at, at, at Penguin Books or whatever. It's um, it's good it's good to make those connections and you never quite know where they might end up so that's how i ended up with an agent but the rejections came later the rejections came from editors right who couldn't see a place for i let you go uh which was um I'm trying to think of the exact words from one particular publisher a, a clumsy mashup of of police procedural and women's fiction mm. uh and so lots of rejections from maybe a dozen editors. Um, 
you know, a lot of whom really saw no merit in it at all. And then others who said, you know, I, I, it's a great twist or I like the writing, but it's not quite right. And then just one offer, one editor at Little Brown, who uh, is still my editor now, Lucy Malagoni, who, like my agent, said this needs a lot of work. And it did. It needed eight drafts, in fact, before it was um, publishable. But she saw its potential and she's been my champion right from the start. Uh, and I've learned so much from her and with each book we've done together. Mm. It's interesting you say that because we were saying earlier that the sort of mixture of police procedural thriller aspect and the the family dynamics, that's you know, that's your USP and that's what people love. Yeah, it is. And and I think it's it's like any successful genre or successful kind of USP. It's it's always a gamble at the start, isn't it? And and this is because um, I, I actually wasn't the first. You know, uh, there were lots of people doing this, and and actually the, the the author that had a really big influence on the way that I wrote "I Let You Go" was Sophie Hanna, because I hadn't read very many books that mixed what what used to be called the woman in peril, so the yeah, the, yeah. You know, you know, the first person um, female victim, and then I read one of Sophie Hannah's Culver Valley series. Uh, I think it was Little Face I read. And she does exactly that. She does the, the police procedural with Simon and can't remember who his colleagues called. And then the, the sort of the, the woman in jeopardy yeah. perspective. And I loved it. I loved it so much because it, it fed into, you know, I've always loved crime and police procedure, but I also want to know why and I want the impact and I want that sense of, of danger and tension and suspense that you get from knowing slightly more from from the victim and that yeah that that was a huge influence mm. um and of course the genre that sort of domestic suspense i suppose you could call it has just grown and grown and grown i let you go came out the same year that girl on the train came out yeah. uh, wasn't quite as successful as girl on the train more's the pity um and I think that would have been when did before I go to sleep come out? That would be about two thousand eight. Was it really that long ago? Wow! So yeah, since then, Google. Yeah, I I can't remember, but anyway, but that 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 was kind of the start, wasn't it? Of, of yeah. what what I what I call the the new wave of domestic suspense because domestic suspense has been around for you know decades, um, but this this new wave. Uh, is very much um, instigated by books like Gone Girl and Before I Go to Sleep and Girl on the Train and and has carried on and we've got such brilliant writers writing in that in that area now um, you know Ruth Ware, Lucy Foley, so many of us. Well, um, thank you very much. I, um, just before we turn to audience questions, um, I was just I was just going to ask you one last quick. Thing, which is because you mentioned the importance of the twist in your first book but you've become famous for your twists I, I, is it very hard to think up twists or do they come naturally or it seems yes. a very mysterious it's process it's really hard it's really hard and becoming known for something is um is a double-edged sword you know it's obviously great to to have a thing that you're known for but it also puts the most enormous pressure on you and one of the reasons why I haven't so so I've been writing what so 2014 what's that seven years ago eight years ago uh, I haven't got seven or eight books out um, is because I haven't been able to do that every year and I've had some false starts and my second book I wrote and then I didn't publish because it wasn't as good as I let you go and then I wrote I see you which which was great and you know did did well but then I had another false start with a twist that really wasn't going to work and I threw that away. So I've had lots of of um, uh, twists that just weren't going to cut yeah, it, yeah. and books and concepts that weren't good enough. Uh, and every book places a little bit more pressure on me to write something better, write something less predictable, more exciting, more off the wall. And uh, I'm not quite sure how much longer I can keep doing it, but obviously I plan to for as long as yeah. I can. Maybe there'll be twist free books in the future <laughs> Never know. no twist in this book uh shall we go over to um, audience questions now yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much. That was brilliant. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and that Hillingdon Libraries, we're so happy that we had Claire um, just after I Let You Go was published. And she was one of our dazzling debuts. And then she just skyrocketed. Yeah. So, no, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Have we got any questions? Mm. So we've got a few really nice comments as well. Um, Asim asks, could you name one thing you enjoy about writing? Um, the end? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, to be honest, I, I, like, I like all of it. I feel incredibly blessed that I get to do this for, for a living. Um, I think what I love is the freedom to to do what I want really in you know with within limits to that, that I can write about anything I can I can set my books in in any world I don't write a series I'm not tied to to characters um and the the moment I like the best is when I've come up with it comes back to the twist it's when I come up with a twist that I know will work that I know is going to excite people or make them feel cross that they didn't get it or you know prompt a reaction prompt a discussion and that is really really exciting and that buzz kind of stays with me right the way through you know that book and and beyond I still get a, a buzz when I think about I let you go and people reading that that bit so the twists are my my kind of my curse and my charm <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Asim, for that question. Uh, question from Karen. How many successful novels does it take to silence your inner critic? Well, an excellent question, Karen. I have had uh, five Sunday Times bestsellers from my five novels. And so I would say it takes at least six, seven, eight, nine. I, I, I honestly, I can't see it stopping um i am constantly worried that i i can't do it again that i haven't done it well enough um i, I had a slightly bruising experience i mentioned just now that the, the second book that i threw away and it it has it, it gave me a bit of a confidence knock so i'd worked on this book for nine months and it was a very very kind of mutual decision between uh, on the part of me and my editor we had a very good conversation and I said I'm worried about this book I'm worried it's not as, as good as I let you go and I expected her I think I hoped that she would say no no it's it's great it's better and what she said was no I don't think it is as good as I let you go and so we decided to ditch it and it was fine and it all worked out well and it was the, the right decision but that really sort of dented me in the same way do you remember being at school and I don't know if you felt like this but uh, coming out of an exam or a test and thinking yeah pretty good I think I did all right and then getting your results and realizing that you absolutely bombed and so that difficult second book experience gave me that feeling of, of I can't trust myself anymore I, I, I don't know if I've written something if, if I'm writing something that is going to be good enough and the result of that is that my editor now gets my very first draft uh, long before I think most authors would show their drafts to anyone. I will give her my, my rough, awful, messy first draft. And the question I always ask is, is this the book that we're going to publish? Is this, ca can, I, can I make this into a Claire Macintosh book? And I need to know that so that I don't waste any more time. I, I need my confidence to know that actually this is, you know, you're on the right lines. This is OK and now. And then I can go and make a really brilliant book out of it. Uh, so that's a very long answer to your question. Uh, the, the short answer is I don't think it will ever go away. Awesome. Thank you. Great question, Karen. Um, another question from Lizzie. How do you put your words down onto paper? Do you write on a computer, laptop, or do you dictate? That's such a good question, Lizzie. I write on a computer or a laptop or an iPad with a keyboard. And I write slightly, so I, I do slightly different work on different things. So right now I'm editing and I'm, I have to edit 
at my desk where I am now on a really big screen and, that, and it's big enough to have two documents side by side. And I do that because I have the old draft on one side and the new draft on another. And I write it out like a brand new, like a fresh draft every time. So I don't edit on my old document. I, I start a, a new one, sometimes even change character names. It feels very much like a new story because I change a lot from one draft to another. But if I, um, go on. Oh, sorry. So we know you um, uh, said you were writing on the plane, so you don't have to be at your desk necessarily. You can write. No. So, but I couldn't edit. So if I knew I was traveling, then I... I, I would sort of manage my workload so that I don't have to edit. I would have a, a particular uh, piece of, of work that I'm just writing. And then what I love most is to write on a very small screen where it's very difficult to move from one window to another. Uh, and the reason I need to do that is so that I can't see notifications. It's hard to switch to Twitter, to Facebook, uh, which is all too easy to do on, on my big screen. Um, so yeah, diff different devices. I can't write longhand. Um, I'd love to, because it feels like a proper writer. I always think it's so lovely when you, you see people writing whole novels longhand, but I, uh, I just can't, I can plan longhand and I like to plan with pen and paper, but I can't write like that. And I would love to dictate. And I, um, so Joanna Penn, JF Penn dictates all her novels while she's walking. And so as a result, she's not only prolific, but really fit. And I think that's brilliant. <laughs> I'd love to do that, but I just, I type very fast. So I, I was, um, one of my first jobs was as a, as a, a secretary and I type um, uh, maybe 85, 90 words a minute. And so that's pretty much as fast as I can think, but I can't speak that fast. And something happens to my brain between thinking and dictating. And I can I could dictate emails, things like that, and um, you know business letters, I suppose, but not creative things. Awesome, thank you. That's so interesting with that that tiny little, I suppose, process of going from your brain to you know actually speaking it. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, a question from Rekha. Uh, apologies if I mispronounce your name. Um, hello, Claire. After all your research and simulation exercise coupled with police experience, has it made you nervous about travelling? Uh, and do you now watch everyone more closely? I've always watched everyone closely, Rekha. Um, and I think all writers do, you know, all writers, journalists, we're, we're all people, people. And so uh, I don't think that's changed. And now I don't feel any more nervous about traveling, but I've never been a nervous traveler. I've always loved flying, even loved that kind of slightly weird bumpy feeling, you know, a bit of turbulence. I find it quite exhilarating, uh, but I don't know. I've never had a bad travel experience yet, touch wood. So no, I'm not a nervous flyer. Awesome, thank you. Um, one more question and comment, I think, and then and then we're done. Um, another one from Lizzie. Do you jiggle your chapters characters around or are they written as they appear? I love that. And from now on, I'm not going to refer to editing. I'm going to refer to jiggling. <laughs> and my editor is uh, henceforth going to be known as the jiggler. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I jiggle a lot. Uh, I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot. And and I'm so I really plan my books. And again, this is a bit like not being able to write longhand. If, if I could be any kind of author, I would be uh, someone who just writes from a blank page, you know, like Lee Child or Lisa Jewell, who don't plot things, they, they just let it evolve. And I think that's really exciting and quite creative and makes me feel, you know, like a a proper writer should do that but I don't do that I plot everything and I plot it like I'm investigating a police murder and I've got whiteboards and post-it notes and timelines and all sorts of things and that should mean that my books come out perfectly because I've plotted it all but it doesn't and so I get to the end of the first draft and then I realize that actually that's fine but it would be so much better if I told the story backwards or if this happened at the beginning and you thought it was that, but actually when you get to the end, you realize it's this. And so it involves so much jiggling 
that everything moves around and that's why I work from a blank document every single time and write the book again and if I can carry stuff over then I do but I would say that maybe 30% of my first draft makes it into the final draft wow that's okay. yeah inefficient <laughs> Brilliant, though. Brilliant and absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, and we have a lovely comment from Sarah. She said she met you at the Chitting, oh, sorry, Chipping Norting Festival 12 months before your debut novel was released. You were so enthusiastic about it going ahead. Um, and the second year it ran um, about her, your debut. And then she asked if she could have a copy. You sent her a proof copy. So, yeah, thank you, Sarah. That's very lovely. Well, I... You know, I love book bloggers. They do such an incredible amount of work for no money at all. You know, they do it because they love books and they love authors and they want to shout about their books. And, you know, the I don't know a single author who isn't grateful for book bloggers and all that they do to support the industry and turn people into readers. So they're, they're good people. And Sarah's one of the best. Oh, Sarah, we're so happy that you were here this evening. Um, those are all the questions we have. So just again, a massive thank you to Claire and Jake, everyone who's tuned in. And I really hope you've enjoyed it. It's been such a pleasure to be here. And if anyone is watching this, this, this is going to be saved, I think, to your page. It's to our our Facebook, page. yeah. So I, um, if, if, you, if you're watching this later on and you wish you could have asked a question, then put it in the comments and I will come back uh, probably over the next sort of two days and, and answer any questions that you've got. That is an offer. That is an offer. Make sure you put a comment in. Do it. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. And uh, Claire, where would uh, you recommend the best place to buy your book online? Would you go for like bookshop.org? Or... So I would always ask people to support an independent bookshop. So if you're the sort of person who would love to have a signed copy, then uh, you can find a link on my website for my local independent, which is a tiny, tiny little Welsh shop. Um, and I pop down there and I have a cup of tea with Gwyn and write your message and your dedication and, and it gets posted out to you. So it's very much a local experience. Um, and if you don't want a signed copy, uh, then any independent and yes, bookshop.org.org. Um, UK I always end up on the American one by mistake but bookshop.org um, is a brilliant place for supporting indies um, so that would be great uh, and of course use your libraries because we need them um, so if you're local to Hillingdon uh, and you haven't yet got a library card then for heaven's sake go and get one awesome thank you so much <laughs> been brilliant okay well um See you soon, everybody. And please check out the Hillingdon website. Um, so hillingdon.gov.uk forward slash library events um, for more exciting events coming soon. And we'll uh, see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.